All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all of your myriad of blessings in our lives. We give you thanks for the joy and privilege of being able to gather together in your name and worship you, and now to study your word. So we ask your blessing upon our study today, our conversation, that it may enliven our faith, enrich our relationships with one another, and empower us by your Holy Spirit to go out and do the tasks which you have called us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So, we talked about how Job, the book of Job, is, is not really uh, about um, just the idea of suffering, but what that means in the context of our relationship with God, that suffering isn't necessarily a consequence of sin. Um, it's not a direct consequence of sin in your life, so it isn't like, oh, you did this wrong thing, and now God is punishing you, and that's why that happened, right? We learned that that's what some of Job's friends think is what happened and why he lost all his stuff. They're saying, well, God is just so surely you must have done something wrong, right? So we're kind of in the middle of that conversation between Job and his friends, okay? Um, and in chapter 21 and 22, we have Job speaking in 21, and then again in 22, Eliphaz speaks to him. And we'll just go with our first question here. For those of you who read, does Eliphaz make some good points in chapter 22, or is he completely off base from what you remember? Yeah, Tim. They always sound like they make a little bit of sense, right? Yeah. And they're not totally wrong, right? Um, so one of the things that Eliphaz calls Job to do is to repent. Right, And we talked about how at the beginning of the book when it says Job is blameless, it doesn't mean that he's sinless. It means he's a man of integrity. It means that he, he's a faithful worshiper of God. Right? Are we faithful worshipers of God? Yeah, we are. Right? But are we sinless? Yeah. <laughs> not at all, right? <laughs> we wish we are, but we're not. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the category of Job here. Job is blameless in the eyes of God. He's a faithful follower of God. And so, would it be appropriate for his friend to say, repent? Yeah. Sure. Job has some things he should repent of, right? We all do, right? But that's not really what Eliphaz is getting at, not just a general call to repentance, but making the same case that the other two are, have been making, which is that you must have done something wrong in the eyes of God. You must, offend, you must have offended God, and therefore... That's why this is happening to you. So that's where he gets it wrong. Now raise your hand if you need a hand up. Dave's got some copies. Raise a hand if you need a hand. So he gets it wrong by saying that what's happening to you is because of your sin, right? And one of the reasons that Job rejects that is because who does Job say is in control of, of the whole thing? God, right? And so the situation is not dictated by my sin. Right? God is the one that's in control of what's going on. Here, right? And not only that, but as a product of his mercy, he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Right? And so it's clear that like whether or not you have the earthly blessings that Job had at the beginning is not in direct correlation to how faithful you are in worshiping God. And we learned last week in the sermon that when Jesus came to bless us, that's not what he meant by blessing. Right? He didn't promise us big houses and, and nice jobs and lots of cows and goats and sheep as for Job's day. Right? Um, what did he promise? Us? Better, by the way. Eternal life. Eternal life, right? Would any of you turn eternal life for a bunch of sheep and a big house and a nice family? Yeah. Right? No, of course not. That's that no, is I'm a priceless gift. <laughs> I, knew, I knew what she meant. She, wants, she wants to do a sheep. <laughs> Trish would like some sheep. <laughs> no, I got what you meant. But yeah, so so this is what Job's response is again to Eliphaz is that, that God is in control here. And so he, he replies, and notice that when Job replies, he, very, he only very briefly addresses his friends, and then who is he addressing almost all the time? Oh, God. God, right? Because what does Job know about who can do anything about his situation? 
God. Right? Yeah, God. His friends can't do anything. And in fact, his friends, he says, are terrible comforters in his suffering. Right? He says, like, how great are you at, at being my friend? Thank you very much. Now I'm going to talk to God because he can actually do something about it. Um, so that is, but then he's, he's struck in this tension because he knows he has to go to God and he feels like he has a case to make, but what does he also know will happen if he makes his case before God? Is it going to measure up or is it going to fall short? He, he realizes that God has to be his advocate for God and that he yeah. can't be the advocate and, and it's this this tightrope walk of I'm not trying to be my own advocate I need you to be right and, and we, we learned last week that at, at the beginning he started saying there is no mediator there is no advocate for me before God and then in chapter 19 it switches to I know that my redeemer lives and then he basically enlists God to advocate against God on behalf of and so this is sort of that clash of the mercy and love of God advocating for us on, on behalf of us against the just, the just aspect of God. Because we're not in a good spot if that's the only thing we've got going for us right now. So, so we continue on here. Job in chapter 23 he starts out by asking, um, says, today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. He's talking about God here that I might come even to his seat and fill my mouth, that I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Anybody relate to that? Like, if only I could talk directly to God and he could tell me how he really feels, how much easier would that make, especially when we're suffering? Why does this happen? I just want an answer. Right? Um, would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. All right, so what does Job know about God? Not only is he, is he in control of everything, but he listens, right? He's not going to discount Job's complaints, his, his worries and concerns as irrelevant or as insignificant. Because he cares. Because he cares, exactly, exactly. There an upright man could argue with him, and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not here and backward, but I do not perceive him on the left hand when he is working. I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as bold. My foot has held fast to his steps. So we could understand that in, in Job is saying, like, I have a case. My case will, will, will ring me true, right? If, if this gets carried out in the court, I'm going to get acquitted. I'm going to be not guilty, right? But that's in the context of his admonition of, I know my Redeemer lives, right? Because he's talked about how he can't be the one making the case because it, it'll inevitably fall short, right? So Job continues for a while, then we get Bill Dad again. Um, Bill Dad's fun. Uh, he's usually just very blunt. He's probably, I would say, he seems to be the youngest and least wise of his friends. Uh, well, his friends. Um, so then Bildad, chapter 25, the Shuhite, answers and says, Dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heaven. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his life not rise? How then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born of a woman be pure? Behold, even the moon is not bright, and stars are not poor in his eyes. How much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? Okay, so does that sound like it sort of makes sense? I don't know. A little lower than angels doesn't really put us at maggot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he has a slightly uh, deflated view of humanity. Uh, he disagrees with God there a little bit. Um, but like the statement, how then can man be in the right before God? That sort of makes sense. And we would say we would agree with that. If all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, then, then no, no man can be right before God. Um, but then again, here he gets it wrong again in the same way. It's almost like it always comes back to the same point, which is that he then basically is using that knowledge as the reason for Job's suffering. But you know, he might be the least um, impressive of the three, but 
he at least seeks to, in this chapter, see sin as a condition and not as a series of events, a series of transgression events, which I think El has sort of saw sin as these individual events that you give to the court. Right. Like, it wasn't a condition. Right. Here, we've got a condition. Right. You're, you're, you're a human. Therefore, this is your condition. Right. But again, then where he deviates from what we know of God is that we're all equally sinful. We're all in that state, right? The fallen state of sin. And yet our suffering is of different kinds. Right? Because what's really being honed in on here is not sort of cosmic suffering um, for, for the state of sin, but what's being honed in on is particular sufferings in this life. And why do they happen? How can I explain them? When they do occur, why can't I make a case for why this shouldn't be happening? Uh, all that kind of stuff. So in the context of this debate between him and his friends, right, he's bringing up something correct, just like Eliphaz brought up that he should repent. That's true. But then he takes it too far, right? So if I say to the city of New Orleans, you should repent, is that something that's true? Yeah. yeah but if I say, because you didn't, that's why Katrina came, that's me going too far, right? It can't, I can't say that. I don't know that, right? Um, that would make you a televangelist, I think. Probably. <laughs> I would just then have to heal somebody. Um, <laughs> so then Job replies to that by saying, again, advocating in a, in a weird way, he's like advocating for God against his friends and then accusing and, and questioning God for himself. Right. Have, um, then Job answered and said, and this is my favorite sort of sarcastic response of it. How you have helped him who has no power. How you have saved the arm that has no strength, how you have counseled him who has no wisdom and plentifully declared sound knowledge. With whose help have you uttered words and whose breath has come out from you? The dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God and Abaddon has no comfort. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Um, so, in a, in a way, he's saying, you know, he's sort of sarcastically thanking Bildad for helping helping God. Uh, and then he says, you know, all these things, he, he stretches out the north of the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water and his thick clouds and the clouds are not split under, open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spread. In other words, he's broadening his vision about, about the domain and dominion of God. Right? Because Job's point is that all of this stuff, including his particular sufferings, are in that dominion of God. He's the one who's doing this. So, um, the second question on the handout. So, we'll pause there for a little Does God rule the world according to perfect justice? No? Is he not a just God? Okay. So, he has, he, he is also compassionate, right? Um, so, if God ruled the world according to perfect justice. We have another, it's a commonly used name. Most people throw the word out without really thinking about what it means. Um, and even in Christian circles, people use it. There's a common name referred to that sort of, um, you get what you deserve according to justice rule. Do we know what it is? It starts with a K. Karma. Karma, right? Karma is the teaching that you reap what you sow, but you get what you deserve. And if you do something bad, what's going to happen to you? So yeah. bad, right? You're going to get your just desserts, right? Um, does God rule the world in that way? Yeah. Hey, goodness. No. My question. Because what would happen to us? Eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. My question to that is, no. is that actually perfect justice? That, that description you just made of karma, is would that actually be considered perfect justice? According to the law. Whose law? God's law. Any law. That's the, that's the basis for any sort of legal system. Is if you do good things, you'll be rewarded, and if you do bad things, you'll be punished. Right? Which is a perfectly viable system, by the way, except when everyone involved in that system is what? Oh, <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> right? Because so, so, then what is the law? What is the only thing the law does? Well, uh, where yeah. I'm going with that is the, yeah. the danger is that is, is 
is that somebody could then say, well, then God isn't perfect and just. And what would you say to that? Um, so that was sort of answering the question before, right? That like the reason that God does not govern according to justice is because of his mercy. So, so the, the next question is, does that mean God is not perfect and just? No. Because his, his justice, will. Okay. well, his justice is meted out in totality in one event. Jesus' death, right? right. So okay. all of the legal owing and condemnation of the law is fulfilled in a perfectly just way, which is why Christ had to really become a man and really die. The, 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 the unit of creation that was being redeemed was mankind, right? And so a man had to live a perfect life and had to pay the full price of justice for the wrongs of man at the time. And that happens in Jesus. And so, like, that's how the salvation plan is both perfectly just as well as grace and right, full of grace and mercy. It just wasn't sitting well right at first. And, yeah, it's all good. That makes sense? Yeah, thanks. So that's a good question. Because that's, I mean, people will say that, right? Uh, because in our arrogance as fallen creatures, we often think that we can operate in a way that exhibits perfect justice. But you see, like, think of what that, that word is thrown around so much in our culture, justice, as if we can meet it out perfectly ourselves. And, we, and what happens when you try to do that? You get into all the minutia of, I mean, that's why we have people recalling things that people said online 13 years ago and crushing them for it. It's, an, it's a sort of this effort to write the scales of justice, right? Um, and sort of the message of Job here is that's the domain of God, right? That, that it's beyond our ability to grasp the particulars of our sufferings, the particulars to other people's sufferings. I don't know why Katrina ravaged New Orleans. I don't know why this empire fell or this evil person was allowed to be in power and do all these terrible things, right? And so Job is constantly trying to bring the appeal back to God and away from the actions of people because all of his friends are saying, well, it's because somebody did something wrong. And because they did something wrong, justice must be done because God is just, and therefore this happened. So you just need to repent, and then what's the implied meaning of your repentance? If you just repent, then what will happen? Well, not just be forgiven, but you'll be healed, you'll get your family back, you'll have all your property and everything, right? And then we get into that prosperity gospel, which came up in a couple of their responses earlier, right? Because if, if it's up to my action or inaction, my good or my bad, then who's the one that's really in control of the outcome of your own life? You are, right? So if only I do the right things, then I'll get a certain outcome. If I do the wrong things, I'll get another outcome. And Job's response to that is, you don't have control of that. That's the domain of God, right? Now, the ironic thing is that we know, especially with the Gospels, that the domain of God is exercised in that sort of seemingly willy-nilly way, primarily as an act of mercy upon the unjust, right? Because as we mentioned earlier, if God ruled in perfect justice, we're done. We're all screwed. We're all screwed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, question three. Is Job afraid of God or confident in him? Yes. Yeah, that was a trick question. <laughs> it's a, especially, you'll see this like in his uh, his long dialogue in um, twenty six through uh, twenty nine, oh, actually even through thirty. Right, he's he really goes back and forth. Right, he's 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 afraid of God. He's terrified of God. But he also is the source of his confidence. And so there's this tension within Job, um, which is I think why you can read Job. And even though there are some things that sound like he's accusing God, because the place of God in his mind is always the sovereign who's in control of all things, who's really the only real source of reprieve, that he's the only one that's going to be able to do anything about my situation, that he's never guilty of the cursing God, um, which is what you know Satan, the Satan, the accuser at the beginning says, like, well, if you take all this stuff away, he's going to curse you. He's not going to fall. Job, if anything, Job is still following God assiduously. He's constantly talking to him because he knows that he's talking to the person that can do something about it. Right? Um, so his faith is still in God. Now, how does this make sense of the different ways Job talks about God? That he's got this back and forth. He realizes that the power God has is able to crush him. 
but he also realizes the power God has is able to save him. Yes. And, and and it's 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 both. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is that like strength in our unbelief too? I mean, we all suffer from that. We mm -hmm. all, all yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Oh, this is like Romans seven with Paul. Right. The the good that I desire to do, I never end up doing. The things that I don't wish to do, I always end up doing. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Right. So this 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 is like a a really in-depth look at the, the tension that is in all, all of us as Christians, this idea that like I know a part of me is totally worthy, like in our confession, right? I'm worthy of your temporal and eternal punishment. But I also know the only hope I have to appeal my fate is the same source. It's God. Right? And so that's why Job has this back and forth, and that's why we do too. Right? When something really bad happens, our sinful nature wants us to have a certain response. What's the very first thing? We've been doing it since the Garden of Eden. Question, right? And the question usually carries with it a hint of blame, right? It's not usually why did this happen. It's why did you let this happen, right? And we've been doing that since the beginning. I mean, when when God comes back after the fall of the sin, He talks to Adam and Eve. Adam says, "Well, this woman that you put here with me gave me an eye ache, right? He's blaming God, right?" So we've been doing that. We're, we're great at that. Um, do that for a long time. It's like we're defining. We back it, we back it up and say we're defining justice. We're helping you with justice. Yes, right. Which is sort of the source of like that sarcasm from Job. It's like, oh, it's so great that you helped God uh, do this thing for me. Thank you. Um, and if we so. truly had a, a good understanding of, of, of His sovereignness, His almightiness, His, his all powerfulness. How, how silly um, to, to do that because obviously we don't get his sovereignty, his, his powerfulness when we do that. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's going back against the beginning. The original temptation was that we would be like God, we would be our own God, right? And so we are always trying to exercise our own godhood to our own massive detriment, <laughs> which is both at the same time tragic and hilarious. Okay. Uh, any other last thoughts on that section of Job? For next week, we're going to uh, do the, I think it takes us to the end of the book. I think it's 38 chapters. 40? 42. Oh, 42. So we're not quite there. Okay. Um, let's split it up into, let's do 31 to 37. And then we'll do 38 to 42. So 31 to 37 for next week. Okay. Now we're going to hop over to our uh, seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer. If you have a catechism, it's on page 274. Uh, part of what we're going on, it's also here in your handout. Um, and we're going to start by reading it together. So we're going to read the, the seventh petition itself, and we're also going to read it. Right? So let's go. Ready? But deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. Okay. So open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Okay. Yeah, read it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness of this world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. All right. So, who is the real enemy and source of evil? Satan. Satan, right? Satan and the powers of darkness that are in this world, right? And so, um, like the example I gave in the sermon today um, from the uh, Amber Geiger and Botham uh, Gene um, event, right? His brother recognized what was really happening there. That it wasn't that there was a victor and a victim, but that everyone was collectively a victim of deception and the forces of darkness that work in this world. And so he counteracted that event by bringing the light of Christ, which is the only thing that can 
uh, all that armor of God stuff, right? The forgiveness in the face of a desire for vengeance, right? Um, love in the face of hatred, right? And all those sorts of countercultural things. And that's going to become only more and more important for us to be that in the world as the world becomes more and more divided. Because think of how, how amazing an opportunity it is to witness about Christ in a situation. Now, you may not get an opportunity like he did to read that out in the courtroom and hug the woman who shot your brother. And I hope you don't, because there's a lot of horrible things about that situation as well. But horrible things, as you learn in Job, happen in the world because we're in a sinful and fallen world. And so we're called to bring a piece of that new world in Christ to bear in those situations. And it's going to be weird looking to most people, and it's powerful in its own way, but it's often rejected. It's far less satisfying to the old sinful self. Because change is difficult and uncomfortable. Yes, right. it is. Especially interchange, right? Where that's what God is really calling to us in Jesus, is to turn away from that old self to this new self. And that's, that's why Luther describes it in, in the baptism section, which we'll get to eventually. Um, as a daily dying to self. The baptism represents this daily, and really not represents, is a daily drowning of that old self and a rising of the new self in Christ. Because we can't let that old self win. Because then Christ, that's what the devil wants, because then in those moments, stuff like that doesn't happen and Christ is lost. And all people see are the division and the, and the hatred. Right? Um, so that we, we understand now having been called by Christ and having been redeemed by Christ and having been given the eyes of faith, that the real enemy is not your flesh and blood adversary. That also gives you helpful context for why Jesus commands you to love your enemies. Because often your enemies are what? They're deceived. They themselves are victims. Under spiritual attack. Exactly. Exactly. And so what we're called to do is place their spiritual well-being above our own sense of dignity and self-righteous justification, etc. Right? Um, and that is really hard. And only the only way we can do that is through Christ. Um, okay, uh, next one. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 15. Somebody want to uh, get that one for us? I can pick them. All right. All right. So, um, so who, how are we supposed to pray in the uh, pray in the face of the attacks of the evil one? Call on God, He will deliver you. Yeah. Right. You're not going to be able to do it by yourself. You got to call on God, and He will deliver you. Going back to Ephesians six, um, I always found it interesting that. All of the armor that's listed except for one piece was defensive. Yeah. And the only offensive thing to only use against spiritual, not against our brothers and sisters in Christ, was the sword of truth of the word. Yep. And when you look at Jesus being tempted after his 40 days of fasting, he only used the word to go against sin. Right. Yeah, I, I've tried to come up with different images to illustrate that uh, in my own mind. And, and one that I came up with is that your opponent, your flesh and blood opponent, um, is like behind hovering behind them is the spiritual forces of darkness or Satan himself. And in order to get close enough to deal with Satan, you have to allow them to hit you. And so God gives you the ability to endure those blows in Jesus. Because so much of the spiritual warfare that Christians are called to is one of endurance. It's not one of victory in this life. It's not one of assault or attack but enduring, um, and as, as people point out, the only weapon given is not a weapon that it's, well, it's this, right? right? It's not a weapon that's for flesh and blood fights. Like, I mean, this is a big book. You probably hear something with a book, but, but it doesn't, like if they've got a sword, you're going to lose. Right? Um, so that, that is an important emphasis when we're talking about spiritual warfare, is that our primary job is actually to take blows. Right. Take blows for the sake of mercy to get at the real, the real enemy here. All right, then we got Psalm 91, verses 14 and 15. I got that here, I can read it. 
Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Right, and this is a uh, song talking about God being my refuge and my fortress. Right, so uh, God is teaching us that to not rely on ourselves in those moments, but to rely on him, to pray to him, to call out his name. Right? Um, and what does he promise to do? Deliver. Take care of it. Yeah. Oh, deliver. Yeah, so I, I read a really powerful article after, uh, I don't remember how long ago this was, but uh, I think it was like 2017 when there was that shooting at the church in Texas. And there was... There was just a very, for some reason, it stuck in my mind. There's such a vitriolic outpouring of despising prayer. Like, mm -hmm. oh, what good are your thoughts and prayers? Oh, thanks for your thoughts and prayers. Didn't do them any good while that guy was shooting them when they were in church. And I read a really well written article that um, that God was delivering on His promise, even to those who were shot. In because the promise that he gave them was deliverance from the woes and evils of this life, the woes and evils of sin. So where are those people now? They've been delivered. They're with him. Right? So the world is going to despise our ways of, of fighting. In a sense, right? Our, our endurance is going to be a joke to them. And our efforts on their own behalf often is going to be met with they're going to despise it. Right? But we know that in Christ, they've been delivered, right? That they're no longer in this valley of sorrow, as Luther says. That they've been brought to himself in heaven, and he's done exactly what he promised to do. He delivered them from, from evil. Right? That, that, I've had several images, of, and you just brought it up, uh, with, with that reference to Psalm 23, of God preparing a table for us in the midst of our enemies. Mm -hmm. um, not only will he, he protect us from them, but he's going to feed us. He's going to, to, to give us nourishment to, to sustain that. Well, and it actually goes further than that, because by doing that in the presence of our enemies, he's also witnessing to them, right? And that's what he's calling us to do, right? Not to, to, to take ourselves out of the world, to be in the world, yet not of it, and that there are going to be, there's going to be that suffering and that, and that, um, that pain, but that is where you bear witness because he's made a table for you in the presence. Right? Um, you were just at it upstairs, right? Um, so, okay. Um, let's go to Colossians chapter one. Somebody have Colossians chapter one. You'd like to read it. All right. Awesome. Now notice what tense that was in. It didn't say he will deliver us. It says he has delivered us. Right? So how does God answer your prayer of deliverance? What's the answer to your prayer of deliverance? It's already done, right? It's a Sunday school answer. Jesus. Right? And that's what is brought. It's not some new answer that's brought to you in the midst of your current suffering. It's a reminder of the answer, the only answer, right? That's why when you confess your sins, we don't give you some new word. We don't give you some new response from God. We give you the same one each week, which is the forgiveness of your sins, right? That deliverance made complete in Jesus. So God answers your prayer in perpetuity, but even in the, in the midst of those moments when you call out to him with Christ, you're delivered. You have been transferred from this place of darkness to this place of light. You're now a new creation. Right? We were talking to Job about sin being sinful is a state of being. It's not just the individual acts that come as a result of it. So does so is your salvation in Christ, right? That's what happened in baptism. Is you were the old creature, the old you was drowned, and the new you was born. Um, that's why. We say that you become a child of God, right? You're a new creation. You're made into a new thing. Um, what kind of being is Satan? So, 
He is the father of those things. He is the father of those things. Yeah. Uh, if you open up your catechism, there is, I think it's on page, yeah, 276. What kind of being is Satan? So he's God's enemy, the evil one, who was originally a holy angel. Uh, but he led a rebellion against God and remains opposed to God and all that is good. So the way that I think of Satan, the image that comes to my mind, because I'm a huge nerd and I love Lord of the Rings, is when Gandalf is on the bridge of khazad Doom, and the Balrog, the big beast of fire and shadow, is falling down and he whips his fiery whip and, and gets the ankle of Gandalf and pulls him off of him. That is what Satan is trying to do to us. He is done. He's lost. He's just trying to drag us down with him. Right? Often you get these depictions of good and evil and heaven and hell is like hell is the domain of Satan and heaven is the domain of God. That is not true. Heaven is the prison that Satan has been delivered to by the authority and power of God. He can't contend with God. He's lost. Right? Jesus has put the final nail in the coffin, so to speak. And so all he's trying to do now is wrap his whip of fire around your ankle and drag you down with him. And the only way he can do that is if he can separate you from Jesus. Because if he can't do that, then he's done. There's no way he can pull you off that bridge because Christ is there. Um, so he is a holy angel and a, a being of, 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 of under God who was who was uh, against God and led a rebellion against him and lost. And he's, he's lost eternally. Right. And so um, it isn't like he has some grand design or plan. It's just sort of petty animosity. Um, and uh, C.S. Lewis has some really cool images of when he talks about Satan and, and the devil and those sorts of beings that uh, that there's often this depiction of like a dashing debonair sort of character with the devil, that he's, he's refined, that he's everything you want to be in the world. Um, and C.S. Lewis contends that the only time he would appear that way is when he's using those things as a means of deception. But his true nature is 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 far pettier and worse than that. Um, there's a book called Paralandra, and if you haven't read it, you should. And it does kind of by C.S. Lewis, and he has this dynamic where the devil character is trying to deceive an Eve Eve like character, but God has sent the main character, who's sort of like his champion, to contend against this he calls it the unman and when the unman is in the presence of the eve character he's kind and dashing and he speaks well and he makes articulate arguments but as soon as she leaves because she's the object of his deception she doesn't know who he is the other guy does as soon as she leaves he becomes petty so he's described as like your little brother who's making weird faces in the window and just like constantly making annoying things just to get at you just to drive you crazy um so he's not this great cosmic force. He's an angel who rebelled against God and got defeated. Now he wants to take you with him. Um, why does Satan concern himself with us? Uh, top of page 277. In arrogance, rage, and spite, Satan sought to claim God's good creation as his own king. His goal is to deceive and destroy the human race. To that end, he seduced Adam and Eve, along with all their descendants, into captivity and made them his allies, subject to eternal condemnation and hell. And there's a few scripture references there. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 44. You are your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Liar. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And then Ephesians 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Right? That's what you were called out of in Christ. That's what you're no longer under the influence of. You're no longer under the condemnation that's going to be brought against that. Because in Jesus, he bore that condemnation, defeated it, overcame it. And uh, that's why our hope is in resurrection, right? Okay, uh, on the, yeah. What, what book of the Bible is it uh, Isaiah. 
and there there may also be some in Ezekiel. Um, there's a, so if you have your catechism on page two seventy six, there's a reference to it there, Isaiah fourteen. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn! How you are cut to the ground, you who lay the nations low! You set your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down the shale to the far reaches of the earth. We don't know a ton about the specifics of that, but we do know that he was once an angel in the heavenly court who, for whatever reason, um, wanted to usurp God's authority. And that was, I don't know why he thought that was a good idea. Um, sort of comes to the territory of being God is can't lose. But anyways, um, there may be some in Ezekiel. Um, there's also in Revelation. So in Revelation, they just use different imagery. So in Revelation, he's no longer referred to as an angel. He's referred to as a great dragon. Uh, he's thrown down from heaven. Um, and they talk about uh, not only him, but also the angels that align themselves with him. So when we talk about like unclean spirits in the scripture, or demonic spirits, that's what we're talking about. So um, there were other angels. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Revelation 12. Yeah, that's where they came from. So he says in, the, in Revelation 12, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. The de deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down in the earth, and his angels were thrown down. Because he is persuasive and he is powerful. Like we can't handle him on our own, right? The prayer calls us to call on God, right? We can't handle that. Um, but he's got nothing on God. Yeah, in a way. So, um, like faith in Christ is, you could say, is it sort of a similar thing to Job in that, um, like, con you're constantly being put to the test, right? If, like, oh, I bet you if his friend dies from cancer at the age of 18, he's going to curse God and turn away. Right? Um, I, I bet if this person loses their spouse unexpectedly or has to deal with a debilitating disease for the rest of their life, they're going to curse God and fall away. Right? Um, and that's part of the, the, the reason Job is included in the book of wisdom is, is in the wisdom books is it's trying to get us to see that, that God is in control of all those things. They're not a result of like individual um, iniquity. Uh, and by doing good, you don't avoid those things. So it takes off responsibility for the tragedy of sin and what it causes in the world for you. But it also points you to the fact that, like, the reason that that happens that way is because of mercy. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a stupid question. That's a good question. And it's such a good question that nobody's had an answer for it. That's because Adam and Eve, right? Well, it is Adam and Eve, but there. so they, we don't. Uh, they messed up all of this, right? So he, well, he's he's going back a little further and asking why, like, if God is Almighty, why did He allow Satan to even come into creation and create that situation? So it's, it's the problem of evil, yeah, right? And and our our desire to alleviate that leads us to actually sound a lot like Job's friends, right? That, well, it was an act of some person's will, and we just all have to get screwed over by it. Or, well, you know, it's just it's just the way uh, God had to do things that way in order to. And the real answer from our perspective is, I have no idea. Yeah. I, I trust that God has a reason for why he did that, and that his reason is in my best interest. Because all the other places that he's made himself known to me, he seems to have gone to great lengths to redeem my soul. So why would he then... Do something else, um, and that I think is eventually the answer that Job gets. Right? Um, Job is questioning the cosmic justice of God, and then God basically comes back with, "You're way outside your depth, man. Um, you don't, you don't really know how all this plays out." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And that, and that's really, and that, that's the, really the tension of Job and, and, and the tension of our our lives in a lot of ways is that resisting the temptation to in some form act as God and be in control of things by 
trying to make sense of them when it's far beyond our ability to do so. Uh, and instead of relying on God in those moments, then we rely on ourselves. Well, I don't understand what we can do. Exactly. exactly. I yeah. find it interesting that God allowed um, writers through the Holy Spirit to write about God so we can understand God. And we got this, this tome of books that we're still trying to wrap our head around. And it's only a glimmer into what God's mind is. Right. Um, and so to, to, to ask why God did what he did the way he did it is. is but I think that the other thing too about it, the wisdom in the book of Job is also that it's not wrong for you to come to God with those frustrations and questions because God doesn't stop Job from having those conversations or does he stop him from talking to him in that way. Right. right? He lets him almost like vent it out. And then once he, like, you know, in, in the providence of his own timing, comes and says, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you? Can, can you do this or this or this or this? Well, no. well, here you go. <laughs> right? Um, so, that and that is one of the things that our own humanistic reaction leads us to get really worried about. Like if somebody's asking, like, really good and deep questions of faith, that are expressing some doubt or some concern, that our reaction is like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. It's like, well, Joe did. It's like there's like 20 verses in the Bible, and yeah. even more, or 20 chapters in the Bible, and even more. Right. And so um, the key is with Joe, he wasn't he wasn't questioning the existence of God and then going and asking other people about it. He was taking he he was taking all of his questions and concerns and frustrations to God. And that's what he wants us to do as well. Right. So like the father and child relationship is a great example of how that's supposed to work. Like when you come to your dad or your parent, your mom or your dad, and you're frustrated about something, you probably can't really articulate what you need right away. And you probably unjustly accuse them for being part of something that maybe was your own fault or something that was beyond your ability to see in the moment. And their response isn't, well, oh, you're no longer my son or daughter. Get out of my house. Unconditional love. Right. Exactly. That's how it all kind of plays together. All right. Thank God we can't understand. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Because then we wouldn't, we wouldn't need them if we could understand. Well, and that would be the, the irony is if the fallen creature bound by created the created universe could understand God, then he really wouldn't be God. Right. right. And if he was, he'd be a bad one. He wouldn't be the one that created everything. Because if I can understand it, that means he's also a creature bound by all the things I'm bound by. So the very fact that I can't understand many of the things he does or why he does them, to me, is a testament that he is God. So, um, okay, we are, I think, out of time. So uh, we will finish with the conclusion next week. I was I had a little, uh, little Hebrew in there for you. Uh, so you'll just have to, you'll have to, you'll have to wait till next week, but it'll still be there. Huh? Um, we'll do the conclusion there as well. So we'll do that, and we're also going to do Job 31 through 37. So Job chapters 31 through 37. I have a couple questions. All right, let's close with a word here. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so powerful, so big, that we just can't understand everything there is to know about you, the creation, and your purposes for us and creation as a whole. Help us to rely on the things that you have in your grace and mercy revealed to us about yourself, that you love us, and that though you needed perfect justice in order to meet that out and still be merciful and graceful, you needed out your perfect justice on your own son, and, rose, and he rose from the dead victorious over death. So be with us this week as we go out to our various vocations, our work, our family, and our friends and communities. Help us to be you, to imitate you in our lives so that they can see you through us and come to know the joyous promise of salvation that we enjoy as your children. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a good week, everyone.